We face this at Fuller Seminary. It's a crisis. You all know there's a crisis in seminary education today. There are 10,000 less seminary students today than there was 10 years ago. A thousand less of those are from Fuller Seminary alone. We were the largest seminary in the world and we have a thousand less students today than we had 10 years ago. And everybody is asking questions about the value of seminary education and about the how we are gonna serve and train and care for people. We still believe there is a value to theological education. We are deeply committed to training people, but the world is changing so rapidly, and we can't just double down on what we used to do. So when we ask ourselves, what does theological education and leadership formation and Christian leadership development look like in this rapidly changing world, it can't just be the past. But like but to do a genuine adaptive work, you have to build it on your core DNA. And just a, for Fuller, this meant that we reminded ourselves that Fuller was started by two people and not one. It was started by an East Coast academic, Harold John Ockengay, and a right West Coast radio evangelist named Charlie Fuller, who had 15 million radio listeners. And from the very beginning, it was always about scholarship and technology, about research and about ministry, about theology, and about mission. It's always been both. And so as we go through our own trying to think through what an adaptive change looks like in theological education, we start listening to people who start saying stuff to us like a businessman who says, I want my business to be more and more a reflection of the justice of the reign of God in the world. I have an MBA from one of the leading institutions in the country. I don't need a Masters of Divinity from Fuller. I'm not going to pay the money. I'm not going to take on the debt. I'm not going to write a 40-page paper. But I know I need a deeper theology than my Sunday school education. Could you give me something like that? Or a Hawaiian church planter who said to me, um, who, said, who literally invited me to speak in his church. He said, I invited you to come preach so that I could take you to dinner and I took you to dinner so I can tell you this, I'm never sending anybody else to Fuller Seminary ever again. He was one of my classmates. We'd gone to school together, and I looked at him and said, why? He said, Todd, we actually think there's something that God is doing amazing here on the islands, but it's not coming in the way that you and I are used to. Almost every church being started here is being started by some guy who runs a termite company. He's got a Bible study in his office, and the people around him are thrilled, and they come to his Bible study. And after a while, they look at him, and they go, look, this is like the best church I've ever been in. These people love me and care for me. It's like half AA, half Bible study fellowship. I can't figure out what it is, but it's a church. We should just open this to our neighbors. We should just invite people here. And the termite guy kneels, and they put their hands on him, and now he's pastor termite guy. And my friend looks at me and says, what am I supposed to do? He's not, say he's not a pastor until he graduates from Fuller? And he's not going to stop, move his family, close up his business. He's not going to move to Pasadena. If you give us tools, if you teach us, we'll train them. The largest church in the Western Hemisphere is in Bogota, Colombia. It has 100,000 members. They have 25,000 pastors they minister to every single year. On New Year's, they do an event for a million people. And two years ago, right after New Year's, they flew all night long to meet with us at Fuller. And they looked at us and they said, look, um, we're having a revival. And we need you to train us. We looked at each other and thought there was something wrong in the translation. We thought they were saying, we're having a revival. We don't need you to train us. We thought we were saying, you're having a revival. We need you to train us. But in humility, they looked at us and said, we think that God is doing something great here, and we need you to train us, and none of our people can afford your degrees. So what would you do for us? And now we have to rethink, what does it mean for us? So we restructured the entire school. We began to ask these questions about how do we help leaders help their people grow? We still give graduate degrees. We still have master's degrees and PhDs. And there's still stuff that we're going to do that we're deeply committed to because the church needs it. But we started realizing that there were more and more people who needed training without degrees. More and more churches who wanted formation Without, without the kind of formal theological education. And so my group has developed a thing called the Fuller Leadership Platform, where we are learning how to take together the very best research of the school and make it available to people right in their context. A digital learning space, an online community. 
I tell you this story because what I want you to recognize is that you can't go into bring adaptive change that betrays your core values. Your adaptive change must be a healthy adaptation of your values and that people will experience that as loss. Because once you've determined what will never change, you must then be prepared to change everything else. And that's why the third principle is you've not succeeded until you've survived the sabotage. Because sabotage happens every single time. Ed Friedman said, if you're a leader, expect sabotage. I want to say something more about this because this is the place where most of us struggle. This is the place where most of us feel the pain of trying to bring change and where most of us have what Friedman calls the failure of nerve. It's at this very moment. This is the hard space and place. Friedman puts it this way. The important thing to remember about the phenomenon of sabotage is that it is a systemic part of leadership. It's part and parcel of the leadership process. Another way of putting this is that a leader can never assume success because he or she has brought about a change. It's only after having first brought about a change and then subsequently endured the resultant sabotage that the leader can feel truly successful. Sabotage is not the bad things that evil people do. Sabotage is the human things that anxious people do. Sabotage is not people who are trying to thwart the will of God, it is, the, it is what people do who are genuinely believe they are trying to hold on to the will of God, afraid that we are going to lose it. And so it requires deep trust to go through sabotage together. Sabotage is normal. It's natural. It's to be expected. It's what a system naturally does to protect itself. And so when you're trying to lead your church into change, and you find the very people who asked you to bring the change start to be the people who undo the very change that you brought, know that this is a natural part of an adaptive system. Friedman takes it even further. He says, a major difficulty in sustaining one's mission is that others who start out with the same enthusiasm will come to lose their nerve. Mutiny and sabotage come not from enemies who oppose the initial idea, but rather from colleagues whose will was sapped by unexpected hardships along the way. Do you remember the, the search committee that brought you to bring change and now doesn't come anymore? Or the staff people who looked you in the eye and told you to, to, that they were, they were behind you and then all of a sudden you realized that they had all pulled away? Or have you ever experienced being the saboteur yourself? I remember once when one of my friends called me one morning and said to me, Todd, I'm so embarrassed about what happened last night. I said, I don't even remember. He said, you know what? I had too much to drink even by the time you got there. And by the time we were through dinner, I was loud and I was embarrassing and I embarrassed my wife and I embarrassed everybody. And I, I'm calling you this morning. You're my best friend. And I want to tell you that, Todd, that, um, that I'm an alcoholic and I need to not drink anymore. And I heard him on the, say this on the phone and I said to him, really? I didn't think you were that bad. You see, he was my beer buddy. He was my go to the bar, have a couple of beers, and watch the ball game buddy. This is what we did. We played cribbage. We hung out. It was fun. I've, I'd never experienced anything bad at all. But I remember when he called me, and I remember when I said that, because I didn't want to experience the loss of the change of my friendship with him. And he went back to drinking, and everything seemed fine until finally it wasn't, and he called me again. Only this time his wife, who's one of my dearest friends, called me and said, Todd, I need you to support this, or he won't stop drinking, and our family's doomed. You sabotaged it. The reason why I can feel such compassion for the very people who are sabotaging the changes I want to bring is that I've been the saboteur. And the very same experience that you will have in trying to lead change in other places, you're the one who is stopping them. This is not about bad people. It's about people who are anxious and are experiencing loss 
and who, don't, who need help and support to go through it together. What do you do when you face sabotage? You stay calm, you stay connected, and you stay the course. These words from the Lombard Peace Institute have been meant the world to me. You have to manage your own anxiety, your own reactivity. When people sabotage us and they stop what we're doing, we are angry, we lash out, we push back, we demonize. Then we want to stay away from them. We cut them off. We, we distance ourselves from them. But what we have to do is be able to manage our own reactivity, stay deeply connected in relationship. And if we believe it's what the Lord has called us to do, we've got to keep on doing it. Principle number one, people don't resist change. They resist loss. Principle number two, for healthy it must be a healthy adaptation of your core dna it's your transformation of who you are once you've determined what will never change you have to be prepared to change everything else and because people will experience that as lost they will sabotage and that you have not succeeded until you survive the sabotage and then lastly everybody must be changed especially the leaders leadership is transformation it's about the transformation that we go through so that we have the capacity to see the new thing that God is doing and we have the capacity to live into the new thing that God is doing. So when Lewis and Clark walked over the Lemhi Pass and when Meriwether Lewis saw that the mountains in front of him, they were completely lost. They were in uncharted territory. One scholar said they knew less about the American West than Neil Armstrong knew about the moon. Neil Armstrong had seen pictures of the moon. They went into a world where every single person, every expert they would brought, every person on the core of discovery was lost. Every single one of them except one. There was one person who wasn't lost. She was a Native American teenage nursing mother. Sakagawea. We know her as Sacagawea, but when they wrote her name in the journals, they wrote it as Sakakawea, and I think they heard it from her, so I'd like to give her back her name. When they walked over the Lemhi Pass, they were actually in her home territory. She was Shoshone. She had been kidnapped at 11 or 12 and taken over the pass. She'd been held as almost a slave by the Mandan tribe. She had been sold or won in a card game by the French tra trapper Charbonneau. And, but there was something about her that was so impressive to Lewis and Clark that even though she was so profoundly pregnant that she gave birth right before they broke camp, they took her with them as an interpreter. They hired Charbonneau. They took her. They thought Charbonneau was worthless, but over and over again, she was a person of incredible value. And when they stepped over the Lemhi Pass, she was the one that wasn't lost. I just want you to think, every time you think Lewis and Clark, every time you think about this incredible group of explorers who like faced down grizzly bears and rode through rapids and scaled mountains and went through hordes of mosquitoes, remember she did it too with a baby. <laughs> and she was the voice that led them. And it was her relationships that took her into the Shoshone in an amazing story where she is interpreting to the tribal chief, Kamehameha. And halfway through the interpretation, they realize that Kamehawait is her brother and that she is the young girl who had been kidnapped and that these folks had brought her back. And they embraced her and they loved her and they rejoiced that she came home and they asked her to stay and she decided to stay with them. And William Clark called her the pilot that took them through the mountains. And the Shoshone were so generous, they gave another man, a man they called Old Toby, their best guide to take them with them. And they would say they never would have made it through without him. What's powerful about this metaphor for me is that for those of us who are going into uncharted territory, it reminds us that there's all kinds of people who have been living in uncharted territory. That there are people who have already been there. That those who had neither power nor privilege in the Christendom world are our trustworthy guides. They are necessary leaders when we go off the map. They are not going into uncharted territory. They are at home. 
The first, the, in the first weeks that I was at Fuller Seminary, when I came back to the seminary as a newly minted vice president, they took me on a tour of all of my division departments, let me meet all the people who would now be in my team, and I would meet them one after another after another, and I finally got to one place, and they said, we want you to meet this person. He's only going to work with you for the next three weeks until graduation, but we want you to make sure that you don't miss him because he's a great guy. His name is Pablo Kim. Pablo Kim. His parents were Korean missionaries to Argentina. He grew up speaking Korean in the home, Spanish at school, and English so he could go to college. He's trilingual. The future of the church does not look like Todd Bolsinger. I'm in a place of power and privilege today because 20, because 30 years ago, Hollywood Presbyterian gave people who looked like me scholarships. But the future looks like Pablo Kim and Juanita Kim. And the thing to recognize for those of us who are in this moment is that this is God's own doing. The global church, the the majority world church, the immigrant church, the Latinx church, the African American church, they didn't have the powers and privileges of Christendom and they have got vibrancy and vitality and voices. They're at home. David Gibbons, who started an Asian American congregation in Orange County, So the future is already here. It's just on the margins. And while some of us aren't comfortable with the notion of the margins, for those of us who've been in the center, we've not learned how to listen to the folks who are all around us. Teresa Cho, who's one of my doctoral students, who's about to graduate with a D-Min, has been leading a a, a co-pastor in a congregation in inner city San Francisco, says for smaller congregations, there isn't a sense of perishing because the heyday left over 50 years ago. You have to have something to feel like you're losing something. So she said to a great big group of church people, jump in, the water's fine, and God is faithful with us. Adaptive change is the capacity for us to deal with our own learn, to be able to confront our need for our own learning and deal with our own losses so that we might continue on and proceed on. So let me share my last couple of stories about Lewis and Clark, and then we'll, take, we'll use the rest of our time for some questions. One of my favorite story in the whole thing is what happened when they finally made it to the Pacific Ocean. They, came, they went across the Rocky Mountains because they got horses from the Shoshone. They would never have made it without it. And Sacagawea and Old Toby led them through, and they finally made it through 300 miles of mountains, 60 miles of hip-deep snow, they make it to the other side. They end up in what is now Oregon, and it's raining, 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 raining. If you've ever been to Oregon, it just rains. And they found themselves on the coast looking at the Pacific Ocean, and what they had to decide is they knew that they weren't going to get to go back until the following spring, so they were going to build a fort. And wherever they built this fort, they would plant the flag, and this would become the United States of America in the New World. This would be the place with the outpost of the United States of America. They would plant that flag. As a military unit, Lewis and Clark had the complete authority to do so with their own authority. Wherever they established this fort would be, this would be America. And they decided at that moment to establish America with a deeply American idea. They took a vote. And they gave everybody in the Corps of Discovery one vote. Will we put America on this side of the river or this side of the river? And everybody got a vote. Everyone. Everyone. Including Sacagawea. And including York, William Clark's African-American slave. The first time that a woman, a Native American, an African American had a vote in the United States election was in 1805. So far off the map, it was the future. Now, the reason why I point this out to you is because I believe this is why God is taking the church into the future. The reason why he's thrust us into uncharted territory is we live in a world today that is deeply afraid of the future where more and more people are trying to live in nostalgia, where more countries are going back to the past and are fearing the world in front of us, we are the people who know the God of the future. We know that a day will come when every, all the nations of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Alleluia, 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 amen. 
We are the ones that know that a day will come when their justice will roll down for all. We are the ones that know that the future is held in the hands of our God. And with that knowledge, we can lead the world into the future of justice that he calls us to. But if we are fearful of the very future we have in front of us, we will never be able to. I want you to know that I believe that this requires dramatic change. Lewis and Clark were men of their era. They were not perfect in any way. When they came back, Meriwether Lewis later, after they completed the mission, he ends up committing suicide. He lived with such incredible depression that was held at, that he medic, self-medicated with alcoholism that finally the pressures of being a hero on the other side took their toll on him and he committed suicide. And William Clark, that incredibly magnanimous man who befriended Sacagawea, who raised pomp, who, let, who gave York a vote, when he got back into the world, he writes to Meriwether Lewis and says that he's decided that York has become too arrogant. York asked for his, to be paid by being sold to another master so that he can be with his wife, and I had to beat him and remind him who his master was. They were men of their era. They were deeply broken in the ways that we are too. They are not models that we emulate. They're mirrors we identify with, but they remind us that what Jefferson said when it was asked why Meriwether Lewis could do such an incredible thing like the core of discovery when he had suffered with so many of his own demons his answer was that he believed that the travails of the expedition kept the demons at bay. Let me put this in my own theological speak. We're at our very best when we're on mission. When we're doing the mission of God, we become the people of God we're supposed to be. When we keep wanting to go back into nostalgia and back into our own power and privilege of a Christendom world, when we try to go backwards, we become the worst parts of ourselves. Adaptive leadership requires that we change and be transformed.